Hey, I'm really excited about the topic we're going to be talking about today, staying top of mind. This is something that's so important in, in the success of my business, this principle, and I'm excited to dig deep on this one. Yeah, me too. Um, I know you are all about this, Mike. You're listening to Biz Buzz. Super authentic, actionable advice. We're going to open the kimono and show you what's inside. I'm scared to see inside Mike's kimono. <laughs> hey, it's Mike and Tom with Biz Buzz. <laughs> if you like geeking out over business, marketing, and entrepreneurship, this is the podcast for you. But I think I have been too over the years. I just haven't put a label on it necessarily. Yeah. So I think I've inherently been doing some of these things. Yeah. And I, I guess like one way to think about it is you work super hard to get these contacts and this network and clients and customers. And I think most people allocate a tremendous amount of work up front at the start, right? To land them and get the sale or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And then they kind of join this pool of people that end up getting neglected. And it's like, yeah. why did you kill yourself trying to get this person if you then don't actually follow up and stay on the radar and keep that relationship going? Yeah. Is that kind of how you think about it? Oh, totally. It's exactly what happens. And I, I do a lot of coaching sessions and this is a very, very common problem. Exactly what you just said. The cost to acquire a new customer is a lot higher than the cost to resell to an existing customer. This is why staying top of mind is so, so critical. But creative professionals who I work with primarily are so typically bad about staying top of mind. So they work their butt off to get that first project. And then they go dark after that and they just sit around and hope that the client will message them again when they have another project, which is partially true if you if the client has that relationship with you they will reach out to you again if the if the working relationship was effective but there's no guarantee that somebody else isn't going to swoop in during that timeline and sell the client on using them for the next project because you went dark and and this is just such a common problem i've talked with so many people where it's i i start talking to them about their relationships and do you have any clients that you worked with two years ago that you haven't contacted in the last 18 months or two years? And everybody has a huge list of these people. They have yep. these people that they've worked with that have paid them money and they just let these people go dark for years on end. It's, it's, it's waste. It's yeah. waste and inefficiency. Just sat there. I'm almost picturing Mike right now like a pile of people. Yeah just sat like they've just been discarded and put it. to one side. And yeah, it's a huge waste. Yeah, it is. And so it's very common. So digging into this, I, I have a couple things to talk about at the start, just as, as why this is important, I think is an overriding principle. And I've, re I've really been on this uh, bandwagon. It's not a bandwagon because I don't hear anybody else talking about it too much, but it's uh, I've been on this platform or this pedestal talking about the fact that people buy when they are in pain. They buy to resolve their pain. And that's why they buy from any business. And I thought this morning, I thought, is that really true? Or is it that somebody buys a Lamborghini because they're in pain? Is it really true? I mean, obviously you buy from a designer, you buy a logo or a rebrand because your sales are slumping and there's a new competitor whose brand looks better than yours and all of a sudden you start feeling pain in your business and so you reach out to somebody and you buy but is it true that somebody buys a lamborghini to resolve their pain do you think i would that's say that's a perfect case example yeah yeah because what like, is their pain they built up i've been car shopping before you build it up so big in your brain that that you have to resolve this pain because it's agony or when the new the new iPhones come out do people buy a brand new iPhone because they're in pain mm -hmm. so I'll put it this way I have uh, an iPhone 8 and I got it and and I'd always had quite a dated phone so that was my first big outlay where I wasn't super behind the times yeah and when I got it it felt so novel and I loved it and it was fantastic what a great piece of technology now with the iPhone 11 or whatever it is yeah. uh, 
and the 500 cameras on the front of yeah. it. Yeah. My iPhone 8 does not feel as special. Yeah. But I'm someone, I'm not very materialistic, so I'm pretty damn happy with it still. Yeah. But what I think happens with the mass you know, media and consumers is it feels painful. It's like, this feels like a hunk of junk in my pocket yeah. now because everyone's yeah. got the shiny new thing and I feel inferior. Yeah. And that's the pain that, keep, you know, you've got that gap. I should be there. I should be, yeah. you know, with everyone else and on trend and the hot new thing. Yeah. But I've got this dated piece of crap. I think that's yeah. how they make a lot of their money. Th that was my shower thought this morning, that, that exact mindset of the fact that, yes, we still even buy luxury items because we're in pain, because we feel like we need this as a status symbol or something. We need it. And the people who don't feel pain, the people who still love their iPhone 8, are not buying the iPhone Pro Max. They're not buying yeah. it because they don't feel pain to resolve their phone. Now, I bought the iPhone Pro Max because uh, nicely for me, <laughs> Look my, at my wife's phone uh, crapped out the day before these were available. So Did you sabotage it in some way? No, I didn't. But You've I thought of it. it. In the past. I wish <laughs> that I would have been that that uh, had that nefarious. Much <laughs> but no, hers hers stopped working the day before. She couldn't get an antenna connection, and my iPhone Seven did that like a year and a half ago. So mm -hmm. I knew that it wasn't a resolvable thing. We couldn't go get it fixed. I knew what the problem was, and that it was going to just destroy the phone. So I said, you know what, honey, I can take care of this problem for you. Now that's real pain. If you, if in 2019, if you don't have a cell phone and you can't communicate with your people, that's pain mm -hmm. that yeah. the first world people feel. Actually, most of the world feels that. That's uh, go down to, you know, impoverished areas and they still many people carrying around cell phones. And so anyway, my wife was in pain, but I felt the pain even more for her. And I looked at it as an opportunity to give her my fir perfectly functioning iPhone 7 Plus. Here you go. I, I mean, it was super nice of me because I gave her my phone and then I went out and I just spent the money and got the iPhone Pro Max and resolved everybody's pain. Everybody's pain was solved all in. in I, I, I mean, you, you could have technically kept the iPhone 7 and bought your wife the iPhone. I Max. thought about that. J but, just saying, Mike, I, I, you're a nice guy. Pain, but my pain, I had to resolve my pain and her pain, and this was the best idea. That's very, very, very uh, philanthropic of you. Oh, uh, well, I feel good about it. <laughs> okay, so, go, so back to the overall point is that mm. people buy staying to resolve their pain. And, and, uh, and staying top of mind is all about waiting until their pain cycle is, hits to where they're going to buy again. Okay, so I, I kind of wonder where you're going with that. Yeah, but that yeah. makes that makes complete sense. So what yeah. you're saying is um, they won't constantly be ready to buy, but by you staying top of mind over a long period of time, when that time comes, you're going to be top of the list. Exactly. That's the whole. That's the whole sweet spot, and that's the importance of staying top of mind because people go through different buying cycles. A, a client who buys a new website design and, and build from you last year, when are they going to have that need again? In one year, two years, three years, five years? How, what's the life cycle of a website right now? Uh, for my perspective, I would say you probably get a two to five year run on a new website redesign and build. It's gonna yeah. last you two to five years. So if, if during that time, say you're a website designer, web agency, and a client buys from you, it may be two years until they're ready to buy again or five years until they're ready to buy again, but you can't afford to let that relationship go stale for two to five years because by the time their pain hits again and they're ready to buy again, somebody else could have swooped in and built a relationship and be top of mind and you lose the business. This mm -hmm. is the, this is the, the critical perspective of understanding this pain cycle in business and then uh, being top of mind when the client's ready to buy. Okay. So I've made a couple of notes okay. as you're talking there. And I, th I think what you're saying is, or well, this is kind of what I'm getting from it anyway, um, there is probably baked in inefficiency and therefore wasted time and money 
by a lot of people out there trying to sell at the wrong time. So in your example, let's say they are ready to buy again in two years time. I would imagine in many industries, what people are doing is they are trying to sell three, six months in, and they're nowhere near ready for the point of sale. So let's say that, you know, you run the numbers and you say, if we reland this client or we get additional work from them or whatever, um, we will earn this amount of money. And therefore we've worked out, we have a 10 grand budget to allocate to the trying to reland that client. And where my mind goes is, okay, there's a few ways you could spin this. You could pour that 10 grand into just selling and selling and selling to them for two years, but actually you're only going to get them at the two year period and the rest would have been a complete inefficient waste. Yeah. So another way is, okay, well you try and identify when they're going to be ready for the sale. You hold back all the money and then you hammer them with 10 K's worth of marketing yeah. or whatever in <laughs> yeah. sales yeah. two years in and try yeah. and hope for the best. Or the third approach could be where you spread that 10 K into some of the relationship marketing stuff we went through before. Yeah. So you are staying top of mind through allocating some of the monies, not to sales at all, but to staying top of mind. And then when you eventually make the sale at the two year point and try and time that correctly, it's going to convert a hell of a lot better. Yeah. I, I think that's a great, it's a great breakdown of possible strategies. And when you break it down that way, the third option seems so logical compared to the other two, because the truth is, is that if you are, dark with a client, you have no idea when their pain cycle is hitting. You don't know. You're not in communication with them. You're, you're not taking them to lunch. You're not in the throngs of their business and in some kind of consultative relationship with them. And so you have no idea when their pain cycle is hitting. Um, the, what you were talking about there too, I think outlines the problem with cold sales that we spend, I have people ask me for this, you know, they're like, how do I find more clients? How do I get more clients? And they want a magic script that I can send them that they can use on LinkedIn and reach out to a thousand people and get a hundred clients. They want some magic script. But the problem is that you reach out to a thousand people. If you have the right script, you may find one out of the 1000 people that has pain sufficient to buy, that's probably priority number one. You, they have to have pain that's sufficient to buy. And then priority number two is they have to have nobody else to buy it from. Mm -hmm. Because if they have pain and then they also know somebody who can resolve that pain, somebody else is already in the relationship, they're gonna hire the person who was already in the relationship to resolve the pain. So. For cold sales, you have to find somebody who is in pain and has no way else to resolve that pain. And then you have a chance of landing them as a client. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of, if you look at it that way, it, it highlights the inefficiencies in cold sales and reaching out cold calling. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. it's so inefficient. Yeah, and I hate that. Like my entire company and career has been predicated on flipping the script on that because I just hate the laziness of it. I'm yeah. gonna blanket send out, like I, I literally go straight in the bin. If we get a CV where it's like, dear sir or madam, dear yeah. institution, yeah. I am applying to work at your company because it yeah. will be a very good fit for me. It's like, yeah. no, like yeah. <laughs> you've just sent that out to 10,000 companies. Like yeah. it's so lazy. And so I really love going the extra mile. I love going super, super deep with this stuff. Yeah. And case in point, um, I, I didn't even pitch. I, I approached someone just to build a relationship and hopefully it leads to something. I am so busy right now, but I spent 30 minutes researching everything they did. And I wrote just the most personal email, like everything about it was completely catered to that person. I got a real deep understanding by like speed reading and watching through everything yeah. they were about. So I had a tremendous amount of context and that's why it bugs me where I'm like, well, I'm very busy and I bother to do that because I see the benefit. Yeah. So for the more junior people out there who maybe don't have as much leverage as you and I might have, Mike, why are they doing the generic spammy, yeah. lazy approach of like zero personalization and zero depth and zero relevance? Like it's yeah. just a sucky way to do it. Yeah. So 
I, I totally agree. And, you know, the personalization, making it real, we talked a lot about that in relationship marketing thing. And, and that's going to be a common thread through all the things that we talk about for sure. Um, that it's, it's super, super important. Um, okay. So we want to transition over. I think let's, I, we outlined the problem clear enough. And now we can talk about the solutions of how to actually stay top of mind and nurture these relationships over time so that when the client's pain hits, they're ready to buy from you. Do you think we've outlined the problem sufficiently? I th yeah, I think we have. Um, yeah, we, we've highlighted the inefficiencies. We've highlighted the fact that you don't stand a great chance. Yeah. You know, so staying top of mind, you don't want to be that stranger. So. Yeah. yeah, I think hopefully people get it. Okay. T take it away. I Can I make a guess? Yes. It doesn't involve the word lunch because you I, seem to love you know, lunches. <laughs> you know what? I built my business on lunches. And so I have a whole list of ways you can stay top of mind and ways that people have done it with me and ways that I have done it with my clients. Is it just a list of restaurants? It, it is. It is. <laughs> Olive Garden and uh, McDonald's. Yeah, now Starbucks is... Uh, can you imagine how much business has been done in Starbucks? I mean, that's a, that's a metric we don't know in the world, but I would love to see that statistic. Man, Starbucks, if anybody from Starbucks is listening, try and calculate how much business has been done in Starbucks and start marketing that uh, metric in your mm -hmm. marketing. Take 1%. Get the world, get the world to, to understand that, you know, last year, $4 trillion worth of business deals were done in Starbucks. In Starbucks Over Coffee. a terrible latte. Yeah. Honestly, it's, a, it's, a, it's probably some astronomical, yeah, I bet you know, it hundreds of billions of dollars of business was transacted in Starbucks. All right. So I think one point that I'll make before we jump into the how do you stay top of mind uh, process is that you can either wait for the client to feel pain and then be top of mind for them to buy from you, or you can stay top of mind and build a relationship where you actually create pain in your client. And I'll show you an example, a few examples, and we can banter on this a little bit on how to create pain with a client. So if it's just you, like thumb screws and that kind of thing. It can be, it can be switch <laughs> blades and, you know, chains. It can be mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Uh, or yeah, I it, had, had you down for that. <laughs> psychological pain. Yeah. And I'll talk about the psychological things. You can talk about the uh, physical afflictions if you choose to talk about those. You're more of a verbal <laughs> abuse kind of guy. Yeah, when it comes that's, to your like, that's how I was raised. <laughs> Yeah. You, you so piece of that. Amy. <laughs> All right. So, so creating pain in your clients or in your customers. And mm -hmm. this is a, a standard sales methodology as well. A lot of times people don't know that they have pain. When the iPhone came out and everybody was using Blackberries, they didn't know that they had pain. They thought their Blackberry was great until Steve Jobs shows them the iPhone. And then all of a sudden they realize, like you were talking about at the start, Tom, uh, that they realize that their Blackberry is a piece of junk. And now they have pain <laughs> because they want the better thing. And, and Apple's done this consistently over the last 25 years of creating pain by bringing out new technology. So the way that we do this with our clients is we help them understand market trends. We help them understand inefficiencies in their business. We help them understand ways that they can improve their business. And I'll give you one. I use this example a lot too. I love this quote from Cisco that uh, Cisco released analytics that in 2021, 80% of all video or of all internet traffic will be video based. And 13% of all internet traffic will be live video. Did you know wow. that? 13% in 2021 will be live streamed video. So let's say you're my client and we're sitting in a Starbucks sipping on our latte and I start talking to you about the importance of video in your business and I give you this statistic and I say something like, yeah, any business that is not focusing on 
getting video incorporated into their digital marketing is going to really struggle in about a year because their traffic and their exposure online is going to plummet because they're not using video based on these statistics. And that's why our agency is focusing on creating videos and helping our clients get into video. And then we continue to sip our latte while this mulls around in your brain and you're the client thinking, crap, I'm not using video. Mm -hmm. I need to get some video. Who should I get some video from? I just created pain in the client by telling them real statistics, telling them where the industry is going, telling them what we're doing as an agency to resolve this, and I've created a potential buying scenario because of, doing, of creating pain in the client. What are your thoughts on, on that, Tom? I did exactly that, and I've got a perfect example for oh, you. This, this is in my, uh, my freelance career. Responsive web design. You remember when that hit? When oh, yeah. That was like the hot new trend. And yeah, yeah. classically, it was initially a trend in the design community and no one else cared. Yeah. But then it became more widespread and prolific. Yeah. And then the conversations I started having with my clients were very, very similar. It was like, look at the stats of how many people are moving to mobile year on year on year. And let's see where this trend keeps going. Your website currently looks terrible and tiny and unreadable on mobile. So you're getting a huge drop off rate on mobile platforms. And this is really going to be hurting your business because the phone is where the attention is. Mm -hmm. And so then I, I started selling them on the benefits of responsive design. So basically exactly the same framework, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. It's the exact same framework. So that's a perfect example. And uh, we did the same thing when responsive came, you start talking to clients about responsive design, they get pain. So pain is also created by them and any business owner who, or decision maker who is staying up on trends is receiving new pain every day. They're reading the news, mm -hmm. they're reading the Wall Street Journal, they're reading whatever business weekly magazines and, and they're, they're getting the information that's creating pain in them. Now you as a vendor, need to stay up on all of those things as well. This is why reading, reading news, reading industry magazines is so critical because you've got to be in the know so that you can talk with your clients about potential pain points that are coming in their business or that exist right now. And what's very important to know, I, I can't remember the name, but I was listening to a podcast recently and it was giving some statistics and basically the, um, of the removal of pain is much more alluring to people than the gaining of pleasure. Yeah. Every single time. And it's Maslow's hierarchy of need. It's the, yeah, you know, exactly that. food and shelter is on the top of the pyramid and, mm -hmm. and that's where we feel pain. If, if, if we don't, if we're starving or if we're cold, if we're hungry, you know, that's the pain thing. And then pleasure is, is on the bottom of the pyramid. Yeah. A hundred percent. And, um, and I found this all the time with clients because I remember this exact example. I would try and sell them on responsive design. And initially I tried selling it to them from a perspective of, look at this thing, isn't it cool? And yeah. look, it shrinks down on mobile and isn't that nice? Yeah. And the response was basically like, I don't really care about this nerdy designer crap. Yeah. Like, you know, I, could, I couldn't care less. That's nice that you geek out over it, but yeah. Yeah. I don't care. But when I start talking about how this is actually necessary because they're going to hurt. They're going to get this pain. If they don't adopt it, they're going to be left behind. That's when I saw more traction yeah. and the response was night and day. And so don't, I don't want anyone listening to be like, you know, pain's quite an ugly word. I don't want people to think this is like tricking your clients or yeah. being a terrible human being. Um, but it's an easier way to help your clients yeah. because you will not be able to sell them on what they need just by being like, Oh, look at this cool widget. Look how pretty it is. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. And you know, you, you and I are both kind of altruistic by nature, good hearted people. We care. Don't take this conversation the wrong way and think that this is a, a, a negative or a pessimistic sales trick. To, <laughs> yeah. Because the truth is, is that, if you do this from the, 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 if you do it because there is benefit to the client, then feel good about it all day long. 
there is benefit to the client because if they aren't using video by 2021 in their marketing, they are going to lose their traffic and the client and the, their competitors who do use video in their marketing are going to start taking market share from them. Pain. Uh, if they aren't responsive, like you were saying, if they, if they don't have a responsive website, they're losing traffic. Meanwhile, their competitors are responsive and they're gaining the traffic that you, you are losing. Pain. So it's, it's to their benefit, to their advantage to buy the things you're selling as long as there's, there's benefit to it. Don't just go, you know, don't go sell them, don't, don't poop in their yard and then sell them a pooper, <laughs> pooper scooper. No, that's not what we're talking about. It's, yeah. yeah. And, and what I would say, I'm sure we might do a whole episode on it at some point, but balance people there is always a middle ground. I am personally so sick of the like very black and white thinking that's portrayed in social media content. Either you're at this extreme end or this extreme end, yeah. there's no gray area. And the truth always lives in the gray area. And what I mean by this is we are right in what we're saying, but if you take that to an extreme, it becomes wrong. Because we've all seen the sleazy internet marketers and sales yeah. pages where yes, they're pointing out a pain point, and yes, their product might even help solve that, but how they're positioning and selling it is basically inciting terror and panic yeah. in yeah. the customers. Yeah. We've seen those. You land on it and it's yeah. like, oh my God, maybe I am like an ugly, poor piece of shit because this page is telling me I am yeah. and I need this product yeah. to, to yeah. alleviate that pain. Well so like, like any of these things we talk about on the podcast, there will be some douchebag out there who yeah. takes it to such a dark extreme yeah. Um, and, and it still works. That's the thing. It still works. But do you want to be that kind of person long term? No. Yeah. So take everything we say with a bit of balance where it's like, it's yes. correct, but you don't want to pull on that lever too hard. Uh, as you're talking, I'm thinking about politics, especially politics in the United States. And uh, it's all extreme per point of view to incite, uh, to elicit a big response from from their voter base. And so that's not what we're talking about here. It's definitely mm -hmm. balancing. So great point. All right, the other point I think I wanna mention before we dig into how do you actually do this is that, I, and you'll hear me talk about this a lot too because I'm kind of on this pedestal a bit too. The idea of seven touch points and branding is something that is one of the, the old marketing you know, cliches from generations ago, and I'm not even sure who first published this idea, but a buyer needs to interact with a brand seven times before they're ready to purchase, they, before they have some brand loyalty. And this is why, you know, Nike sponsors athletes, they, because you see LeBron James wearing Nike shoes, and then you see an ad on television, and then you're driving down the freeway and you see a billboard, and then you drive by the, the uh, mall and you see the Nike store. You just had four brand touch points. You're, you're not even aware that you're having them, but you mm -hmm. had four brand touch points probably today for some of these mega brands, you had four touch points today, and you yep. just don't even notice them. Now, that, take that same mindset of creating seven touch points and apply that to the way that you interact with your clients. Now, this is where staying top of mind, this can give you kind of a framework about how to stay top of mind with your clients. Seven touch points. So your whole goal is to think, I've gotta create seven touch points with this customer before they're ready to buy. Now that's an average, sometimes they'll buy in three, sometimes they won't buy for 15, but the point is, is that you've got to create multiple touch points. And going back to the idea of cold sales, this is why it's so ineffective. That's one touch point. You email somebody a cold email or a cold phone call, one touch point, the likelihood of somebody buying on one touch point is minuscule. Nike doesn't even sell people on one touch point. Yeah. They, if they did, they wouldn't be advertising everywhere you look. They yeah, don't see so you, so you being hired by some company to shift some crappy product on a cold sales call is probably not going to do that well for you. Yeah, it's not, it's not. But if you can make that cold sales call the first touch point, and then you somehow get a response from somebody who says, Hey, thanks so much. 
I'm not really, we don't really need your services right now, but maybe next year, boom, mm -hmm. there's somebody who's, who is a new client, potential client, and that's touch point number one. Now your goal over the next year is to create six more effective touch points with that person to hopefully have them ready to buy from you. Mm -hmm. So I'm ready now, now that we've prepped the audience with some of these kind of fundamental thoughts, I'm ready to talk about how do we do this? How to do that. Yeah. Um, let, let me add one small thing yes. before we get super tactical. For anyone out there who thinks this is just marketing baloney or, you know, seven touch points, that sounds kind of arbitrary. I want them to think about someone like Darren Brown. Like, do you guys have him out in the States? I'm not aware of him, no. Okay, so he, um, I think he's, he's from the UK originally, and he's a mentalist where he will do these incredible feats of okay. not magic, but he'll be able to control people and get them to do unbelievably strange things okay point. okay um and it's really funny to watch like there's one i'm thinking of where he took a woman into a giant department store and they walked up and down like five different you know floors and saw thousands of products and she ended up picking out this giant stuffed giraffe i think it was and then they walked out and he opened a bit of paper he gave her at the start and said you're going to pick out the giraffe and it was just really, really amazing. Uh, but then he, he played back and he was like, this is not magic. He, yeah. And he played back the video and he kept sneaking the word giraffe into sentences, but in a really like sly way. So she uh, barely noticed. Huh. And he, he'd be like, okay, so giraffe to see you, you know, today. And really, it, and when he watched it back, you'd be like, that's so obvious. But when he watched it the first time, you didn't even notice it yourself. Wow. That's so he, kept, he kept sneaking in and he said giraffe like seven times, I think it was. Uh. Um, and, and just to prove this point, and she went straight for the giraffe. And I see this all the time. Like we are more susceptible to this stuff than we realize because the other day I ordered a burger, right? My fiance was away. I ordered a burger takeout <laughs> and, and I'd seen burgers on various social media. I think one of my friends posted mm. that they'd had one. I saw a few things and then I saw an ad on TV for a burger and I thought, right, that seals it. And it wasn't even subconscious. It was conscious. Yeah. I was like, I really want a burger. I feel like I keep seeing burgers today. Yeah. And I saw one more burger. I was like, that's it. I'm getting the burger. Yeah. And I think the same thing completely applies to um, client relationships and, and staying top of mind in that way, right? Yeah. When you keep popping up, like, yeah. you know, the same way you want the Diet Coke or you want the burger, they will want to do something with you or, or at least they will be remembering you in that kind of yeah. way. Yeah, it's uh, the idea of planting thoughts, you know, um, okay, movie Inception, you know, yeah. such a great movie, but <laughs> yeah. they, go, they go six levels deep to try and implant this thought of the guy to sell his company or whatever, and, uh, and uh, that's their whole, the whole thing of the movie, mm -hmm. and it's the same kind of thing. When you sit with the client at Starbucks and you say to them, hey, everybody is going to have a responsive website, and and if you don't, you're going to lose traffic. You're planting a thought in their brain. Mm -hmm. And it may not at that time have created enough pain for them to buy, but it's going to float around in their subconscious. And now they're going to, every time they read a news article that says responsive design or responsive they're websites are taking it. over the world, mm -hmm. they're going to think, oh no, there's my pain again. And then, yeah. you're gonna, and then you're going to like one of their posts on social media and they're going to remember that conversation because they see your name and now your name is associated with the pain, kind of a Pavlov's dog approach. <laughs> and then they're going to think, oh no, I see Tom's name. Oh yeah, responsive website pain. And now they feel it again. And mm -hmm. um, so there is, there's a little bit of this planting the seed and then... In in magic, it's called, you know, forcing the card. A lot of magicians will hold you the, here's the deck of cards, and they'll, and you're taking kind of the card. One. They, yeah. you, they take the card that they're picked, they already picked it for you. But somehow <laughs> they have the knack of just spreading the cards just right to make it the logical choice for you or whatever. They force the card on you, and then they show you the card, but you took the card that they wanted you to take, just like the giraffe trick that you're doing, uh, that mm. your Darren Brown is doing. So, anyway, so yeah, let's ahead. get into tactics, but okay, yeah. I don't want people to think like, this is so kind of like, 
Huckster, you're like, oh, you need to plant the psychological seeds. And yeah. that might sound a bit much. What we're trying to do is just explain why it works, but this is not how it works. Yeah. So when you do this, what we're about to get into is going to be a lot more fun and nice and stuff that you can hopefully get into and enjoy implementing yes. for your business. But I think it's helpful to know the science and psychology behind it. Well put. Yes, 100% on board. This is why. It's the psychology of why. What happens in their brain, they're not aware of it. In fact, I wasn't aware of it until I started to understand all of this in hindsight. Mm -hmm. I did this for years. I stayed top of mind for 15 years of agency life. I stayed top of mind with my clients, but I never thought through how to articulate the psychology of it until just the last couple months as I've been making Instagram posts and prepping for a conversation like this to deep dive on this topic on what really happens in the client's brain. During I love that. it. Well, do right, you want so, to take the first tactical point? Yeah. Okay. Well, you already said it at the start because it's going to talk about going to lunch. It's honestly <laughs> going to lunch with your clients <laughs> is the easiest way to stay top of mind because it's fun. It builds a real relationship. I, I honestly, I built my business on taking clients to lunch. These were clients who became my friends and our lunch, we spend an hour, hour and a half at lunch and 95% of the conversation had nothing to do with business. It was just friend chit chat stuff. What's going on in your life and your family and those kinds of things. It was just building a real relationship and uh, it's the easiest way to stay top of mind and to build a relationship of trust where the client, when they feel pain, will buy from you. It's also a great opportunity for you to sit with a client and drop in the little planted seeds of, hey, you need video. Hey, you need responsive design. Hey, social media, you don't need to build a brochure website anymore. You need a Facebook page. You know, all these changes that have happened in the industry over the last 10 years in the creative industry uh, are easy things to drop, to intermingle into those conversations, not in a salesy way at all, but just about educating your client on industry trends and changes that will affect their business. And, and I, I love what you're touching pain. on. Yeah. Sorry. Um, what you're touching on is not just staying top of mind, but staying top of mind in the right way with the right things yeah because I'm, I'm sure like if you showed up for lunch and set yourself on fire you'd probably be pretty memorable to them yeah. stay top of yeah. mind but, okay. but not in a positive way yeah but everything you're talking about and i think that that's quite an important distinction is what are you trying to stay top of mind with yeah is it that you're an expert is it that you're someone they can trust is it someone who's very on top of things happening within their industry um, because I think you need to kind of have that intent rather than just, well, I'm, I need to try and worm my way into their mind any way I can. It's like, yeah. well, in, in what way? Yeah. Good. Agreed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't, okay. Mean to cut, didn't, didn't mean to cut you off there. No, it's good. I was done with that. I, I mean, I could go on about the importance of taking your clients to lunch. I could go on about that for five hours and tell like, you numerous stories, but I, I'm not going to do I, that. I, I do want to get a little bit more context there because you've talked about this so much. Yeah. Um, you mentioned in the relationship marketing episode how like you would obviously pay. Yeah. Um, would it be like, I don't know, I just, I, I guess in terms of the details, would you normally be there first waiting for them? They come in, you get up, warm greeting, you sit, you don't talk about work at all. You just have like a good time. and Yeah, chat, it depends and on the thing. You know, sometimes I would go to the client's office and we would leave together to go to a lunch. Sometimes we would meet at a restaurant. It just varies depending on the client and, and the lunch location. But it is that kind of thing. Usually you wait in the lobby for them and then you get the table when you're there if it's not a reservation-based place. Um, and it's the, you know, the bro hug, or even, <laughs> even with women who were clients, you know, it was the, the professional business hug style. It wasn't anything weird and quirky and um and then it's just you know how are things going you drop a couple compliments you talk about their life and their family and just it's just building real real relationships we did do our relationship uh our relationship based conversation yeah, already um, but it is just about it's just about being real and being human trying to make a human to human connection with somebody not 
supposedly a, I'm trying to sell you. If, you, if they sense that you're trying to sell them something, most people are out. People don't want to be sold junk. They want the illusion of making their own decision that they chose the giraffe on their own. They want the illusion of thinking I chose the giraffe. That's most people. Most mm -hmm. people don't want you to say, to stand up and say, hey, here's the giraffe. Now, the benefits of the giraffe are these, and you can choose the hippo, but the hippo's worse because of this, and the giraffe is better. Now that lady who chose the giraffe from Darren Brown, it feels like she was sold the giraffe. And she's yeah. like, do I really like the giraffe? I kind of like the hippo, but I feel like I should buy the giraffe because of all the benefits he said. And, and so people sniff that out. It's so much better just to build a real relationship and to talk about pain points in their business from a, I want to benefit you mindset. I'm not doing this to sell you on the fact that you need to use video in your marketing and you need to hire me to do it. I'm just trying to help you understand that video is changing the landscape of digital marketing. And in a year from now, it will be dramatically different than what it is today. And hey, here's your lunch and hope you like it and see you next time. And you don't sell at all. It's just mm -hmm. about dropping those things. But what happens when that client goes back and reads an article about video and marketing and then they talk to their boss about video and marketing and the whole time they're thinking in the back of their head, we really do need to get on that, man. Mike was right on the money on that. I read three articles about it today. I'm going to call Mike and see if he can come in and, and do a little presentation for us. Mm -hmm. that, that's exactly what happens in, in a service-based business and a creative service-based business like this. I love it. Um, I've got a note written down here, and this is something I came across a few years ago, learning marketing, and it was called the Be Everywhere strategy. And yeah, I like it. Th this is kind of along the same lines as the uh, touch points that you mentioned. But essentially, when your potential clients or your current clients are literally seeing you everywhere, that really compounds and that can be so powerful. And I hear this quite a bit. People literally message me and they're like, dude, like I was reading a blog and your name came up. And then I listened to a podcast a couple of days later and you were the guest and then someone mentioned you on another podcast and then yeah. I saw your Instagram here and then you <laughs> featured in someone's newsletter and they're like, you seem to be everywhere. Yeah. You're like, you're everywhere I look. You seem to know all the same people that I know. All the people I follow seem to be friends with you. And that has been in the last six to 12 months, one of the most powerful things that I've seen within my career that is having such an impact and opening so many doors. And it's just because I am trying to be in as many places as I possibly can. And that's also quite a scalable way to uh, stay top of mind because I'm able to stay top of mind, not always one-to-one -one with clients and customers and followers, Yeah. but at scale, you know, I've got thousands of people having that experience of seeing me in tons of places and I don't even know all of them personally. Yeah. I love that. It's, uh, I love that be everywhere strategy. So good and right on harmony with the idea of touch points too. So it's really great. Um, um, all right. We want to talk more about tactical, actionable. How do you do this? So lunches is one thing. Do you have a couple that you want to drop in? Yeah. So, well, the be everywhere is one thing and, and okay. you can do that not just on other people's platforms, but with your own content marketing. I think that can be effective. So yes. imagine if you've been for lunch um, and then that person also connects with you on social media and then a post comes up. Let's run with the video example. You do a, a kind of thought leader piece around the impact of video on yeah. this particular industry. So they've had lunch, they've had the conversation, they've read three articles in the paper um, and kind of had you still in their mind. And then suddenly they're on their LinkedIn feed and you do a really compelling piece articulating yeah. the same thing you did at lunch. Yeah. Um, but in an article format. So that content marketing piece can, again, be a scalable but highly effective way. Yeah, that's a really great one. So content marketing, and you also mentioned another one, social media is um, part of that. So being in social media, using these platforms and posting is all touch points that you have. So connect with your friends. 
or, or with your clients on social media. As soon as you meet somebody that day, go and connect with them on LinkedIn. If you feel comfortable enough, connect with them on Facebook. Follow them on Instagram. And then start commenting and interacting with the content that they share because those are such easy touch points. It's the client posts something and all of a sudden there's a comment from Tom in the, in the feed. That's an easy touch point. It's non-salesy at all, but it's a reminder that, oh yeah, Tom's a good guy. Oh yeah, Tom exists. Oh yeah, I need responsive mobile design. All those mm -hmm. things happen su subconsciously when they see that little comment on there. So that be everywhere strategy, um, social media is such an easy way to create a touch point uh, like that. Um, all right, going on to the next thing. Another one that's super effective. I'm gonna give you a couple that people did for me that th there were there, I have two examples that people used for me to stay top of mind and I love both of these things. So the first one is I have a skateboard deck hanging over my desk that was a gift from an illustrator that we hired to do some video game packaging artwork for a Xbox game that we did the package for. So we hire this external illustrator and after the project is over, they gift me this skateboard deck that is my logo with a cool design on it. And I have had that thing hanging in my office for 10 years. I'm never gonna get rid of it. It's such a cool reminder of the principle, number one, it's a reminder of my old logo and brand, it's a reminder of that project. That person has stayed top of mind for 10 years by giving me a gift I cannot throw away. I'm never gonna not hang it, it's, it's cool. So that's one example. Another one, and I know you have a great example of this one, it's hanging behind you and, and you should share that. But another example is I had a, we hired an animator for a project and then they sent me after the project, they sent me an animated logo of my agency logo. So this is something that didn't cost them any monetary dollars no money, it just cost them time, but it was such a cool animation. It highlighted what they, their capabilities, and it was so personalized to me and my agency that it meant a ton. Now this person then posted it on Behance and it got a ton of traffic. And then somebody asked if they could use it in a book for a logo and a logo animation book or something like that. And so, I authorized that he reached out to me and asked if if he could use it and you know get rights to use my logo in the book with this animation I was like totally and uh, anyway so it was such such an easy way to use his talent to stay top of mind uh, absolutely and every one of those additional wins you got you got feel good factor you got real tangible benefit for your yeah. business and um, you would still think of him each yeah. time. So you're like, none of this would have happened if it wasn't for that. Exactly. Way. Yeah. So it doesn't always have to be something that costs you money to stay top of mind. In fact, it's probably, that's probably the least effective is just buying something. It's not as thoughtful as, you know, if you're an illustrator, draw a portrait of, of the client and send it to him and say, Hey, thanks for meeting with me for lunch and, and send it to them or draw a portrait of their children. If they have a photo on Facebook or something, if you're connected with them, something that's going to be meaningful to them mm -hmm. is what you need to be thinking of. So that leads into my next point beautifully because I put be different. And I think we, we talked previously about differentiation, but this completely maps to stay in front of mind because if you are generic, you're forgettable and you're invisible. And if you're different, often you are, um, you know, you're going to stand out. You're going to inherently by being different and not being generic, you're going to stay top of mind. And I think there's a few ways to do this. So what you've just alluded to is shock and awe mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah. You're doing yeah. something so extraordinary. It's like, wow, people can't help but sit up and take notice. Yeah. And also I've got written down here his stories people have shown I, I believe you've also read um how to create a story brand by yeah. donald miller <laughs> yeah, yeah people people are very drawn to stories stories are what people remember 
and they always have that's how human beings work and so either you're telling a story and communicating a story or you're actually creating a story with your client you're you're doing something you know maybe maybe you don't go for lunch maybe you do like some kind of activity or maybe you make the lunch memorable or maybe you're at lunch and you tell a story that is memorable mm. or like you just told me a story about that gift you received yeah. right no one's ever been like uh, we, we we received these generic um like usb sticks from recruitment uh -huh. uh, companies yeah. and that kind of yeah. thing and apart from like razzing on it for the context of this discussion, yeah. never have I told that story to anyone. Yeah. I didn't call my friends up and I'm like, hey guys, we got a generic cheap plastic USB in yeah. the mail today from a yeah. recruitment yeah. consultancy. <laughs> like, no one cares. Yeah. But you, you see the difference? Like when, it, when it's story worthy, I think that is one of the best ways to be remembered and, and stay front of mind for your clients. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So tell me the story of this guitar behind you, because this person is top of mind for you for the rest of your life. Tom has mm -hmm. this beautiful Gibson guitar hanging in the back of his office here. And, uh, and this person who, oh, you tell the story. Yeah. So um, this is an incredible person, a guy called Tama from Texas. He um, had been working with me. I've been trying to help him a, a bit with his business. And this was a while back like a year ago and i didn't even remember telling him but evidently i told him it was one of my bucket list goals to own a gibson les paul guitar and i'd kind of had this as one of my life goals i th just thought they're so beautiful with a cherry sunburst and mm -hmm. i was planning to get one when i was like 50 years old or something you know <laughs> maybe like a retirement present for myself yeah yeah <laughs> um he remembered this simple thing i'd said and about six months later a giant box shows up at our offices and he had bought one and sent it to me out of the blue as a thank you. Completely out of the blue. I yeah. thought it was a mistake. It didn't even have a note. I had to call up the guitar company and be like, yeah. there's been a mistake. Where's this come from? And when they told me it's this friend of mine in Texas who sent this thing, it yeah. blew my mind. And I have told so many people about this. I've, you know, talked about it on my show and, yeah. and, all kinds of places and it's hanging behind me so yeah. people ask me on calls all the time like i see it every day and i always think of tamar and he's such a sweet guy yeah That's him. He, he didn't even want anything but if, if he's like you know ask me for anything i want to help him out because i'm like you're the kindest man on earth exactly and not just anything today but when you're 80 years old yeah you remember that and if he emails you or calls you, you are going to take the call. You're going to step out of your meeting. It's such a massive impact item that you're never going to forget him. So there, there is the way to stay top of mind forever if you think outside the box a bit yeah. and make and, a wise investment. And it doesn't have to be a Gibbs and Les Paul. We do this stuff with my company all the time. I always say be personal, be specific. So when we get lovely gestures and gifts for the partners we work with and, and for our customers, I always say, don't be that plastic USB stick, right? Yeah. Don't, don't be generic. And we've done all kinds of crazy stuff. Like we will stalk people on social media, find out something they're super stalk. passionate about. <laughs> I don't and, know if you can use the word stalk. <laughs> stalk them on stalk, social media. Stalk, stalk it up. Uh, we, yeah. we, pay, we pay lovely attention to them on social good. media. <laughs> um, and, um, and we send them an incredibly personalized gift that is going to emotively connect with them and mean so much yeah. more and yeah. be so much more thoughtful. And in many times it could be half the price of something that we could have got that was just a generic hamper or gift or something like that. Yeah. But it's the fact we took the time and care to actually think about it and learn about them and figure out something that really is going to matter and they really want to keep around. Yeah. That makes the difference. Yeah. It makes a huge difference. Um, okay, one last one that I would say is that um, an easy way to create touch points and stay top of mind is to leverage um, less awkward times to communicate with your clients. And holidays is one that is so easy to send your clients a personalized email. And, and end of year, let's talk about how you would do this right now. Every single person listening to this can create a touch point with their clients, this is gonna. This podcast is gonna launch in January, um, probably the end of January. The new year just started, and you're listening to this podcast, 
and you can email every single client you've ever worked with and say, hey client, happy new year. Just wanted to tell you thank you for the work that you've sent me over the last year or two years or whatever. It's been a pleasure to work with you. I wish you the best in 2020. We're so excited about this new decade ahead. Um, thanks for working with us. Boom. That's it. It's just a simple personalized email. You just created a touch point with no awkwardness, with no salesy push, with no request of any kind, just a nice touch point. Everybody can do this. And so if, you're, if you go with the mindset, I'm trying to create seven touch points with people. You can go the big, the big ones, the skateboard, the animated logo, the Les Paul guitar, or you can create just multiple little touch points over time that just remind them that you exist and that you're a good person. I love it. Um, I feel like we might have to go into fast forward mode because I know we've got five minutes left. I and say I got... we just go into the recap mode, but go on with what you're saying. I, I got to get through these because they're front of mind. I've got oh, my notes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fast um, forward. All right, so I love that idea. Use Christmas, New Year, Thanksgiving, all that yeah. kinds of, kind of stuff. First of all, again, personal, specific, deep with it. So an email is great. A personalized email that's actually calling stuff out from their life, even better. Yeah. Even better, why not something like a video? And I, I might have mentioned this on the show, Mike, but uh, yeah. I did 400 personalized videos for the designers we work with one Christmas. It took me hours. I lost my voice. It was yeah. a madness. It was so unscalable. Yeah. Yeah. People were like, this is insane. I can't believe you took the time to do this. Awesome. Send me a per so Not like Merry Christmas, like literally yeah. like, hey, Mike, like, yeah. you know, and a personal message for you. So yeah. you can have fun with that. I've, I've written here, smaller is easier. 400 mm. people is hard. 5,000 is impossible. Yeah. But if you've got 14 clients, three clients, whatever it might be, the less is more, right? You can go deeper with those people. So that's one thing. Another thing is use milestones on their milestones rather than generalized ones. What I mean by that is if your client's company turns 10 years old, you can celebrate that. Love that, yeah. You can be like, you know, you can send the video or the email or the phone call or the gift or whatever it might be, but on their terms, not yeah. Merry Christmas to all my clients, but like yeah. happy 10th anniversary, you guys are killing it kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Um, also CRM. We didn't touch on so yes. stuff like contextually and HubSpot. When you are dealing with more clients or customers, it can become very tricky. And I've got written down here is make them top of your mind as well as you top mm -hmm. of their mind. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the time it's that you have the intent and you want to be doing this stuff. But in the day to day chaos and craziness, it's very hard to actually remember and keep tabs. So if you use something like a HubSpot, they actually have a free plan. Yeah. Um, you can get reminders that trigger and it's like you have not talked to this person in two months, yeah. you need to reach out to them. Um, so you can start getting processes around this stuff. My favorite CRM that I used was Pipe Drive. Pipe Drive. I don't, I don't low, know that one. Yeah, low, lower cost and uh, customizable, great user experience. Uh, so I highly recommend Pipe Drive if you're looking at a CRM. Your budget CRM is open up a spreadsheet and create a row that has every name of every person that you've ever worked with or interacted with in business. And then your columns become 52 weeks of the year, 52 columns and however many rows you need. And then every time you interact with that client, you put that, you put notes in the column that says, Oh, commented on their Facebook post. Oh, took them to lunch. Oh, sent them a holiday gift basket. You know, you just put it what it is and you do it for every week of the year. So you can kind of watch the touch points over time and see who you are neglecting and who you're actually interacting with. But you've got to cry, try and create some way to track it. I love that. And what I found works well is batching um, because I'm really bad when I get so busy at remembering to kind of fit this in and, and yeah. follow up with all the people. If you believe in this, you could say, okay, every Friday afternoon, is going to be my client top of mind outreach process. So I'm going to sit down for four hours once a week and I'm going to send all the emails and make all the phone calls and send a couple of gifts. And I'm going to do that every single week. And I, I've allocated that time. So yeah. that gets done rather than me trying to fit it around my busy day. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Do we want to tennis match the a little recap here in the end? 
Yeah, let's do it, man. Okay. We've got, um, if, got a I'm, minute I'm or gonna, two here, right? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna email my uh, my <laughs> co-host that I'll be a couple of minutes late on the other okay. show. Take it away, man. Okay, so uh, the first thing is you have to understand the pain cycle that people buy when they're in pain, and you need to be top of mind when their pain hits. I love it. Um, we've also um, got be everywhere try and be seen everywhere and you know they can't can't look around without noticing you somewhere okay and then we have you can create pain in your clients by understanding industry trends understanding the needs of their business pointing out to them changes that can benefit their business without the intention of hard selling them just with the intention of helping their business and helping them understand where things are going Love it. Uh, another one is be different. Remain top of mind by standing out, by differentiating. Um, and then I think I'll, I'll say just to, to emphasize what I was just saying, don't hard sell them. Man, if, if a client is not in pain, all the hard sales in the world is only going to make them resent you, not buy from you. So hard selling is disadvantageous to your ability to close a deal with them, but creating pain and waiting for that pain to be sufficient for them to buy and then being top of mind on the buying decision is effective. Love it. Um, got content marketing as well. It's a, a great strategy for staying top of mind. Yeah. Content marketing. Um, and I think, I mean, we, we could just whiz through these, uh, these last few things, take people to lunch, take people to coffee, Starbucks, wherever, personalized emails, holidays, gifts, social media, connecting with people on, on uh, social media and interacting with their posts. And I've, yeah, I've got a note next to that one. So engage more than you consume. 99 Point nine percent of people are just scrolling and never commenting, never engaging. So if every time you see something from these clients and these people in your network, respond to their Instagram stories, DM them, comment on their posts. It is so freaking rare that anyone does that, that you will be amazed at the impact it has when you do that consistently. It's awesome. Okay. Well, I think that's a good, uh, oh, track, track it in a CRM, track it in a spreadsheet, mm -hmm. track your, your, your communication. I think that's what we ended on in that. Any final yeah. thoughts, Tom? Nah, boom. That was, uh, that was value packed. We, yeah. we got it in there. <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, it was super fun. I'm passionate about this topic. I built my business with this mindset. I didn't know that I had this mindset until after the fact, but mm -hmm. I see it clearly now. So I did all of this without even realizing I was the psychological approach to it. I did it just because of being, trying to be good at my business, you know, that was, that was my mindset. It wasn't ever any of the psycholo the psychology that we talked about today. I never had that in the forethought during yeah, the and it, that I did it. It's, it's not nefarious. It's not like, you know, super difficult or any of that. When you put it in a nutshell, it is get people to like you and remember you. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. And that should be a nice exercise because uh, you basically do that by being proactive um, in their lives by being helpful, by bringing value, by being yeah. nice, by connecting. Like you can do that just by actually being a decent person and by not being lazy, by not being generic, by not being passive. Well, I can just give you an amen on the end of that. And uh, I have nothing left to say. Great recap and great summary of, of some of the core principles. So thank you. It was super fun to chat that. again. Always, thanks for bringing that topic. It's, All it's right. a good one. All right, brother. Um, as always, everyone listening, um, you know, your reviews on iTunes would mean the world. Mike and I might even do like a little happy dance. We'll release a video maybe <laughs> thanking you guys for all the reviews. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, Mike, but hey, if you're down for I'm that. In. I'm in. Depends how many <laughs> reviews we get. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and yeah, as always, do tag us up if you want to mention us in your stories, where you're listening to the show and that kind of thing. We absolutely want to respond. We want to connect with the core listeners of this show. So please do you know, mention us, hit us up on social media. We love our core fans. We want to stay top of your minds and we you know, want 
you to stay top of ours as well. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, it's been a long day. I can't even talk anymore. No, that's like. true. <laughs> um, hashtag Biz Buds Podcast. And uh, we, you can also check us out at bizbudspodcast.com.